We're actually going to start rasping some wood here. So the first thing I'm going to start off, if you remember, if you saw uh, part one, I talked about a high spot here. I'm going to put my scale, or if you want to call it a straight edge, you can see, my goodness, down here, it's not too bad. It goes, though, all the way up to there. I'm leaving the butt plate on it. Um, you may wonder why I'm leaving the butt plate on it. For one thing, since I will be, let's take a little rasp here. Let's get a little rasping. Probably broke some guys' hearts out there. Uh, there you go. There's the mountain. There's the peak of our high spot. The difference between where this butt pl butt pad is, butt plate is, and that, my goodness, <laughs> we got we got a good a good eighth of an inch. So let's just start knocking that baby down. And like I said, the reason I kept the butt plate on there is it gives me a little indication, a couple reasons. It gives me an indication of how far I've got to go. One of my students, I used to teach jewelry making, metal smithing. And one of my students said, you can't talk and work at the same time. And it was somewhat enlightening because she's got a, she had a point. Somewhat hard to do at times. Now you're seeing how that birch, or that beech wood, the color of it, what I'm going to have to deal with when I start staining it. My goodness, that baby is low. One thing that scares me here, uh, I th did not talk about it in the intro but that walnut stain is really deep and it scares me about putting my red stain on there if I could get all the way below it all over the stock I wouldn't be concerned but that's not going to be the case there are going to be areas that I'm just not going to be rasping or even filing I will be simply sanding. And can this sandpaper uh, to get below? Look how. Let's take a let's take a finer file here. Oh, let's take this guy. And let's just see how deep this stuff goes. Okay, we're through the finish right there. We're through the well, pretty much. Let's go a little deeper. Definitely through the finish. Am I? Looks to be, eh, it's hard to tell. Take a little more. I'm thinking there's probably, yeah, I think there's, it's probably a wipe on stain or some kind of stain on the raw wood, and then they probably had a stain in their finish as well, their urethane or whatever they used. So, will I be able to sand past that easily? That's my concern. I mean, it is what it is. We're going to have what we have. But that's all I'm checking now. How deep I might have to go to get below the stain. Eh. I think we'll be okay. It'll be areas like this. Can I? Yeah, we're, we're areas like that that absorbs the stain quite a bit. Uh, that area is going to not have a lot of rasping done on it. Uh, so that's that's a little concern. Will areas that sort of, sort of like the open, the end grain of the wood that's that absorbs a lot of the stain, and will my sanding be able to get below that without? me going below the area of the wood that I want to go below. So, I switch tools around to see what works best 
on my oh yeah this baby's cutting nice this baby's cutting nice this is that I think this is that blue Dan no this is a Nicholson it's cutting nicely if you've noticed I'm sure most many of you have sometimes I use the half round side of my rasp and sometimes I use the flat side of my rasp what sort of is weird is the uh, half round side cuts quicker so you do your hogging in a way with that if you can and then you get to your other side your flat side excuse me I just want to lock this in the vise a little better there we go you can see how big of an area that high spot was and you can check while you're working like that take your straight edge and check see where we're getting far far less wiggle there's no sense working into there yet I'll probably work the flute a little bit before I get this perfectly flat but it's some still very high up here look at that I don't know if you can see it I got at least 3 30 seconds of an inch between the butt pad the butt plate and my high spot I'm going to blend that a little bit I'm going to work back here tilting my rasp down that's not my blue dan is it no that is my blue dan I want my Nicholson that was cutting better yeah you can hear it you can hear it and I can feel it oh yeah so we'll do some blending seems to be low and uh, low here that's horrible not hard you know I mean uh, when I picked this gun up this I had like I said this is well those CZ people out there know that the 457 hasn't been out there that long I saw a good deal on I don't know what site but I saw a decent deal for it and I'm a CZ fan no, uh, no secret there if you've seen inside my safe uh, so when I picked this up from the gun dealer I, I actually had a drawing well it was photos it was photos I had taken off the web and one of them I left as is the uh, gun as is and the other one I, I sketched on there what I wanted to do to the stock and I showed my gun dealer a good guy I've known him a while uh, we always have nice conversations when I'm picking up a gun and <laughs> he's like you know that's great and he said I think that uh, you're one of my rare customers that I think you'll be able to do what you say you're going to do. He said, but why would you do this to a new gun? Why don't you get an old gun and work on that? And I, I just chuckled, but my boss, uh, like I said, I have a regular job. I'm a CAD guy, computer-aided drafting and design. So I went and mentioned that to my boss. We were just chatting, and he said, he had a good point. My boss is a, a brilliant man. He said, uh, if somebody wants to do something like this they don't have to go source some old gun that's hard to find they can go online and get a brand new CZ 457 and follow your lead or take their own path but and I thought that was brilliant I thought yeah why didn't I think of that see we're getting there guys girls when I taught jewelry making and metal smithing speaking of guys girls most the majority of my students were female uh, maybe because of jewelry I don't know why I don't know why but they were and some of them were excellent crafts with excellent let's get our straight edge out here take a look okay so I am still leaving a high spot here when I said I was starting to blend, I was starting to blend towards that pad, toward the plate, and I left a high spot there. You know, when you get to this point, I guess uh, I'm switching gears in my brain a little bit here. I guess if you have a hard time, you know, when, like I said, I used to hang out with body men. I used to have a lot of friends who were body men, and I'd hang out at the body shop. We used to go shooting every Friday, blah, blah, blah. It was a great time. But the hand, 
they would always, over the body panel, they would run their hand to feel where the highs and lows were. And I got that from those guys. That's, uh, the hand touch can be very sensitive and no, you can really find out what's going on on the surface you're working on. Feels pretty good. Let's see where we are with the straight edge. Still got, let's work right around there. Let's take a little bit. Once we get it down to where we want it, we will, you can see that's less, less of a bump. The bump moved back a little bit. Once we get it down to where we want it with our rasps, We'll switch to a finer file, probably that cabinet file. In fact, let's do a little bit of that. It's nowhere near time to really do it. But let's do it just so you can see what it's like. I don't know if you can see like the marks that the rasp teeth make. But that's what we'll be cleaning up with the cabinet file and other files and sandpaper, no. No, by the time you get to sandpaper, you won't have deep marks like this. When I'm filing off my rasp marks, as you can see, I'm not going in the same way. It's just like anybody who's polished metal or... I don't know what else you do this way. But you're taking out... Here's your marks that you made with your rasp. You file at a different angle to take those rasp marks out. Once you get below, I can see a couple rasp marks there. Uh, uh, this is just a little example of what we do a little bit later, okay? I'm just showing you, but that's what you're looking for. Did I get all the rasp marks out? Yes, I did, okay, then I can move on to the next file if I'm going to file some more, or I can move to sandpaper. That's getting to be a pretty smooth finish there. But like I said, we're not ready, we're not done there. That was just an example of what we will be doing once we get it pretty... F She's getting pretty flat there. You remember how rocking it was when I first started? Where's the high spot? High spot's a little bit right around there, isn't it? Uh, let's, let's knock down to the a finer cut rasp. I actually did go to the Pennsylvania Gunsmith School. I graduated from the Pennsylvania Gunsmith School in, oh my goodness, I don't know. I got out of the service in 77 and started Gunsmith School shortly thereafter. So I graduated Gunsmith School, I'd say the late 70s. And this particular Nicholson Rasp is from those days. It's a wonderful tool. The bad thing is it's very dull now. And it just doesn't cut like it used to. Unfortunately. In fact, it's hardly cutting at all. But you can see, let's get back on track here. Look how little bit of the brown line there is now. I'm really getting down to the plane, basically, that I want to work from. Uh, let's see, let's go back to the Nicholson here. I am using the flat side now. I don't need to have as aggressive a cut. So I'm using the flat side. Let's see how we're doing down here. Let's get that straight edge. Ooh, look at that. Look at that, big bump right there. Big bump right there. We'll work that. That's all there is to it, craftspeople. Going slow, check in. <laughs> like I said, it probably broke some people's heart when I started hacking on this with a with a rasp. And I can understand that, I guess. And don't do it if you don't feel confident. Uh, my gun dealer's idea is not a bad thought. If you're going to do something like this and it's your first time, get yourself some old beat up 22 and play around. Okay, 
I don't know how long I'm going to film here. I guess I could always do one of those, continue to film, and then zip through it. I might shut the camera off and sort of get this down, because you've got the idea now. And all I'm doing is shooting the breeze. But, uh... What do you think is about what do you think we're about ready to do now? I think I'm about ready to check this area with my straight edge. I'm gonna clean that, I'm gonna smooth that up just a little bit too. Just a little bit. Yeah, I'm going the same direction. I'm not trying to get the rasp marks out to go to the next step. I'm just smoothing it down so I get a better view with my straight edge. That's all. Okay, and it's, the old high spot's still pretty far, pretty, pretty high. We've got it down some. I know what I have to do more. I have to concentrate more back here, just like it did up here. A little bit harder on an area like this to use the half round side of the rasp. It just wants to be, it just, it's not as controlled. It's not as controlled. It's going to take out, I mean, the flat, you know exactly where you're rasping. The uh, half round, well, Sort of going a little bit by ear there, a little bit by feel. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> She's getting there, people. She's getting there. Oh, baby, is that high. So I'd imagine at the CZ factory they've got a big, heavy-duty palm sander that they just clean that thing up and then they've got that rotating action wrist wrist action there and hey you know hey it looks great you know when the stock the stock looked great the gun looked great but until you know what to look for you don't always see flaws straight edge time I'll bet you let's let's try the feel here it's still low there, but it's getting better. Oh yeah, look, our, our flat spot, our high spot, instead of being like a one pivot point here, has broadened out. So we know that that's the area we have to work. Push that whole area down, pull that whole area down, rasp that whole area down, however you want to say it. I can feel that. I can feel where my rasp is. And you can hear it dig in a little more when you know I'm hitting more area. Okay. Straight edge. You can't check too much. I mean, you can. I got a cousin who would check too much. Uh, <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. So I'm moving on up a little bit, blending. We're almost up to the flute area. Remember, this was that area right here that I was telling you. Oh, boy, can you feel that? What a nasty bump there. You know, I was... Has, here's, a, here's a saying. When I was teaching metalwork, I used to tell my students, you have to make it in your head before you make it with your hands. So I th sit there when I'm contemplating this job, I don't just go at it and hack away, although it may seem like that. I've thought it out. Uh, what am I going to do? Where am I going to hit? I wish. Uh, Mom used to, my grandmother used to have a saying about wishing. I won't, won't relay it. Probably most of you know it. I wish I could add some wood here. I'm going to take this back. I'm going to step this back, but I really don't need to. And I, I'm afraid it's going to throw the aesthetics off a little bit. I'd love to have that come out to about there. Then I can do a nice little pretty detail, but you got what you got. You work with what you have. Let's take a check here. Ah, I noticed something that I just did where you couldn't see it off the table. Okay, we're a little high here still. Uh, I noticed that when I was putting my rasp on the table over here then I made sure that I put it on a, there's a towel on the table I made sure I put it on a top piece of the towel where it wouldn't hit anything and that was another thing I used to tell my students when uh, I taught at 
I taught at arts centers and a lot of tools are donated to art centers. Uh, some fantastic tools were donated and other tools that, that they would purchase themselves are usually on the inexpensive end, which makes sense because you've got students learning. And when students learn with tools, believe me, students can abuse tools. So one of my sayings was always, uh, diamonds cut diamonds, files cut files. You do not lay your files on top of each other. So when I lay the rasp or the file down, you're not going to hear any metal to metal clink. I take care of my tools as much as I can. <laughs> We're getting there, guys. Girls. People. I think I might... You guys have seen enough of this right now. I think I'm going to move up into this area here, right below the flute, and I'll probably start sharpening the flute, and I might start pulling this, uh, getting... Let's, let's do some of that. Let's, let's have... Like, what did Bob Ross... Have you ever used to watch Bob Ross, huh? The guy with uh, the paintings, and uh, he'd do a painting in 20 minutes, uh, 22 minutes, I think, and, and they were fantastic paintings. But Bob Ross would often say, let's get crazy. Well, let's get crazy. Uh, I'm going to block my light here, probably. Uh, that's the bad thing about worrying about my lights and not having free reign of moving around here. I want to start that little detail. I want to start that little detail that we had on the shotgun. Let's give it a start. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, look how much extra wood's there. That'll help us to blend this whole back part of the stock in. You know, when I'm doing this kind of work, uh, I don't do it all in one fell swoop type of thing, not at all. What we're going to do, what, well, let me finish that thought. Uh, as you can tell, I'm sort of rambling here. I, uh, I sleep on it. I'll do my work, get to a point where I'm pretty happy with what's going on there. And then I'll stop and I'll let my brain work on it as our brains do. Oh yeah. So we're we're going to pull this down, and then we're going to pull that down. We got to get let's 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 do a Bob Ross here. Let's get a little crazy. Let's get some depth to that. Yeah, we're going to blend this whole back part of the stock into that. I'm going to take some of this out too eventually. That I might do off screen because I'm going to have to flip the stock up. And, Okay, I'm going to switch to a little bit of a finer, let's try, let's try this. Mm -hmm. You know what, you can't put any wood back, so go slow, think about it, what you're doing. See, we're going to take this. See that curve right there? Can you see that? Right where that curves. That's going to end up coming out. That little triangle there. We're going to, we're going to have a sharp line that starts there, too. Yeah, I'm not going to go too much farther on what I did right there till I get back here and work. Let's work that bump a little bit. The best way you can see that bump is for me to start filing it off. That's where it is. Here's your body man deal. Feeling it. Absolutely. Taping up the stock. I mean, taping up the action. I'm not worried about the dust uh, on the outside of the, the gun, the action, barreled action. I'm not worried about it in the bore. I'm going to clean all that up. Uh, but what I did was taped off the trigger housing trigger assembly, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to get a file cleaner out here, guys. The rasps, the uh, teeth are so coarse 
you hardly ever have to clean them with a file cleaner. This is a file cleaner. Some people call it a file brush. If it just has this metal part on, they call it a file card. Uh, your files get, the term is loaded. Sandpaper, anybody who's worked with sandpaper knows exactly what I'm talking about. When the sandpaper gets full of whatever you're sanding, they call it loaded that's loaded and it doesn't cut anymore. And files are the same way. They get loaded and they don't cut anymore. Okay, like I said, this will be blended down. Let's do a little bit of that now. See, I'd rather spin around here and work from that side, but... to get in a different position to work on this. For one thing, the wood wants to be cut this way. You can tell it. And I don't like to work backwards like this with my hands. These, <laughs> working on something like this, pair handgun grips, uh, makes me think of making earrings. You gotta have two the same. Uh, let me see if I can switch over here. Okay, guys. And that's a little bit easier for me. I might switch to a rasp. How about the cabinet file? I want something a little coarser. You notice how where when I was working back here, you might have thought, man, he's hacking away. Okay, when you're doing more of a detailed cut, you're not hacking away as much, right? You don't have as... I want to move this line, I think. I think it's time to work on that. I think it's time to take some of that out. Okay. So we're going to rotate this up a little bit. I think I'd probably like to be on this side working. Let's see what I can start with here. Oh, I wish this gunsmith school rasp was still in good shape. It would be perfect for this. Yeah, this is not a job you do in 10 minutes in the uh, shop in the evening. Like I said, I'll definitely sleep on this job. Tighten that up a little more. My vise is padded with, I don't know, some kind of like heavy rubber sheet. I don't, you know what I think it was? It's been so long that that I don't know exactly what it was, but it sure looks like uh, like a mud flap from a big truck, like a mud flap from a semi. See, we're getting a line there. That's going to look pretty. What I call a detail, right? What I call a detail. I'd like to pull this in a little more, I think. But let's not go there yet. Let's not go there yet. I'm going to take it a little bit at a time. Take it and look at it. Probably round this out some too. This is probably getting to be a long video. So I think I'll probably wrap up this. Go upload it to my computer. Get it in the editing program and come back down here and work some more. Oh yeah. What do you think? It's getting there, huh? It's getting there. It's going to be pretty detailed. It's going to be pretty detailed. Definitely have to pull this in some. If you notice what I'm doing right now, I'm pushing my body against the stock. Just so I'm not wiggling it around so much in that vice. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, guys. It's going to be nice. This is going to be so much more detailed. Let's get a little heavy duty action going here. See, like I said, when I switch to that 
half round side of the rasp, you get a lot more cutting action. I guess, you know, I, when I did some, I made a cane. And maybe I'll show you guys that. I made several canes for a man. Had no legs from the knees down. Pete Braddock, God rest his soul. Great guy. Enjoyed working with him. Uh, <laughs> what was the story I was getting to there? Oh, well, it happens to you too, doesn't it? Maybe that student was right. You can't talk and work at the same time. Yeah, that whole thing has to be V'd out there. We gotta get in there and make a little V. So those of you who are a little, we're a little nervous when we start hacking on this, are you starting to feel a little more comfortable? Let me flip this over and take a look at it. Okay, that helps. This is the fun part. Yeah, we gotta take that back quite a bit. That baby's coming back. That's what I was going to say. My Pete Braddock story came back to my head. All right. Pete Braddock, God bless him, was quite a man, quite a man. Like I said, he had no knee legs from the knees down. Uh, did Pete have knees? I believe he had knees. He had knees. Well, he wanted me to make a cane for him, and he wanted it uh, out of ebony, which is why I still have some ebony. I made Pete's cane. Uh, I won't get into that whole story. but. What I was getting at here, when you guys are trying to detail something and you're not sure how it's going to look, there's a clay that you can pick up at a, uh, like an art store. It's, it's a, an oil-based clay. Uh, it's not water-based. It, ne it never dries. So if you were concerned about something like this, you could take your block of clay and sort of form it to where you want to sort of look like your stock, that stock area. And you can whittle your clay down. I mean, you can get an idea. And that's what I had done. Pete wanted, when Pete was a little boy, this is how the story went, he had seen two snakes up in a tree. And he wanted me to make this cane with a snake wrapping around it. And what I had done, speaking of they call it plasticine. They call it kind of clay plasticine. Some people do. I had taken the clay and I had modeled a head. And that way I could show Pete what the carved wood was going to look like when I was done. And I could also, also I had a little model of my own for when I was working on the wood. What has to happen, guys? Right here, right? See how we're starting to get a curve here? We need to get this chunk of wood out. I'm going to flip the stock up to do that. I'm just about ready to wrap up this session because I know it's getting long. Oops. Okay. Let's get that triangle out. Yeah, probably what I'll do it says wrap up this session. You guys have got an idea what's going on here. Then I'll clean it up and probably work the other side a little bit so I have free reign of <laughs> moving around the vise without worrying about am I blocking things. You're seeing this still right now because my camera lost its autofocus ability near the end of the video. Uh, what I've done is in the next video following this, 
I show you what I had done at the end of the video and catch you up where we're at. Um, sorry about that, but this video was pretty long anyway, so probably was a blessing in disguise. Hope to see you in the next video.